In the centuries before Christ, when people would greet each other on the morning in spring, they would say to each other, Happy Ishtar, because it was a feast to the goddess Ishtar, which kind of got taken over. And today people are around saying Happy Easter. Um, they're actually kind of referring to the same thing. The early Christians, when they would greet each other on Easter morning, would not say Happy Ishtar. One would say, He is risen, and the other would respond, He is risen indeed, because that is the essence of Easter. It's to commemorate the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead. It's not about Easter bunnies and you know chocolate bunnies, although they're delicious, um, fertility rice and stuff like that. It's all about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. And just like people kind of misunderstand Easter versus Christ's resurrection, in fact, a lot of more legalistic churches call it Resurrection Day. It's not Easter, it's Resurrection Day. A lot of people miss the fact that Jesus is so much more than death and resurrection. He came to offer and do so much more. Um, last week I went back to his opening sermon at his hometown of Nazareth, and we looked at the first half of the Nazareth Manifesto. And this is where he described what he was about, what he intended to accomplish. So then as he hung on the cross and before he died, he was able to say, it is finished. Well, what is finished? Last week I remembered the view of his prayer in John 17, where he says, I brought you glory, Father, by completing the work you have given me to do. Once again, he had not yet died for sins. What was finished? To understand what was finished, you had to go back to Luke 4, where Jesus quotes Isaiah 61, in what we call today, in theological terms, the Nazareth Manifesto, where he said, this is what I'm about. We saw in Roman number one that God had a plan to bless his righteous people so that he can be glorified. All these things are eventually done so that God can be glorified. We saw in Roman number two, in the beginning of that, that God gives, uses his servants so his people can experience all of his blessings. And then we started enumerating some of those blessings. We actually only got through the first two. Blessing number one was to proclaim good news to the poor, meek, and humble. And the good news is that the plan that God had set up for a kingdom in the Old Testament is still on track. It's in fruition. If people accepted it, it might have come about. And then we saw in Roman numeral 2b, God's plan is to heal the brokenhearted. Not just help you cope, but actually take the pieces and put them back together so you can be full and whole again. And we looked at how Jesus actually did that ministry during his time on earth, but it was dependent upon people doing certain things. For instance, in uh, under Roman numeral 2b, uh, Mark 13, 15, people needed to see, they needed to hear, they needed to understand, and then they needed to repent, they needed to change so that God could heal them. So this is a function of faith. And down at the bottom in Hebrews 12, 4, we saw again that there was a process of strengthening, of making straight paths for your feet so that you can develop new patterns and ways of living. So what Jesus wants to do is heal the brokenhearted. He wants to put back the pieces. Today on the back page of this, Roman numeral 2C, is, starts with the thing that most people associate with the gospel, to proclaim forgiveness or deliverance or remission of sins to the captives. And this is the essential element of Christianity, but there is so much more than just this. But let's make sure we understand this. When John the Baptist uh, was conceived, his father prophesied in Luke 168, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he's visited and redeemed his people. So basically, he's blessing God for the fact that God is coming to his people. And to grant that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. You know, that was the, that's the plan, that we not just get delivered, but we actually can serve him without fear. We can do that in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. So we need to develop a holiness and a righteousness to serve God all the days of our lives. God also gives knowledge of salvation to his people by the sending back forgiveness, the remission of sins. This is all through the tender mercy of God. And then they use this imagery, which is one I'm going to carry through most of the sermon today. The day spring from on high has visited us. 
This word for day spring is about when the, the sun kind of peaks over the horizon and comes up. Before the sun comes up, it's dark. It's not always darkest before the dawn. It's darkest like five hours before the dawn. <laughs> but as the sun starts coming up, it's a little bit of light, a little bit of light. And then eventually we get bathed in light. You know, the sun comes out. And that's the imagery that people who lived in darkness see light. Um, every December I get a call from my mom on my birthday. And uh, she reminds me of all the problems I caused when I was born. <clears throat> and I get the, the whole litany of stuff. And uh, she, she ends it with you know, the story of when I first get brought into the recovery, her recovery room and she sees me. And her initial response, I have this effect on women, is, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the nurse goes to take uh, me away. She says, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm basically complaining about his eyes. He's got the same eyes as his father. His father has bad eyes. He's going to have bad eyes. And now as my mother gets older, she's got all these eye problems. And I'm realizing, you know, from both sides of the family, <laughs> you know, I got eye problems. And uh, there are times when my eyes work well, and you know, times they fade. It's not a fun thing to look forward to. Uh, just for my kids, uh, you come by eye problems rightly on both sides of your family, too. So, you know, it's going to be bad. Sight is good. And if you don't have it, you kind of bumble around in darkness. Not being able to see things clearly causes problems. And people spiritually live in darkness. They don't see things clearly, and that causes them all kinds of problems. But God came to provide light so we can walk in the light. And one of the big things that we see in uh, Luke 1, the tender mercy of uh, our God, they spring on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's not just remission of sins, but it's to guide your feet in the ways that, are, that lead to your future peace. It's not just remission of sins, it's to take you out of darkness into the light. And uh, I grow increasingly convinced that most Christians are still bumbling around in the dark. They just do not see the truth. And one of the things that's really scary is I'm also becoming increasingly convinced that darkness is self-inflicted. Blindness is self-inflicted, and we're going to see that in a few minutes. But uh, picking up on this proclaiming deliverance remission, this is the essence of where the gospel starts. And when Paul was commissioned by the Lord Jesus in Acts 26, 18, Jesus says, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. To do what? to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, from the dark side to the force. <laughs> That's what Paul's mission was. That they may receive forgiveness of sins, and wait, that's not all, act before midnight tonight, and you can also get an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus wants to offer us more than just the forgiveness of sins. He wants to have us walk in the light. He wants us to get the inheritance that was promised in the Old Testament. In fact, Paul's farewell speech to the uh, Ephesian elders in Acts 20.32 is, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to edify or build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. But look at the last phrase of Jesus' commission to Paul, sanctified by faith in me. Does uh, your faith do anything to sanctify you? Does your faith make you holy? How does that work? How does what you believe clean up your act? Does just believing that Jesus died for your sins sanctify you? No, you have to be commended to the Word, and there are other pro things that have to go on, and that's going to come up a little bit later. But two cool verses to keep in mind, and this is what you really want to share with anyone when you're sharing with them about Christianity particularly Ephesians 1.7, in Christ we have redemption through his blood. We have been brought back, brought back, brought, uh, bought back, out of the slave market of sin through his blood. He's redeemed us. And this redemption is the forgiveness of sins. That's the essence of the gospel. God forgives us. Essence of justification. God forgives us. It's something we could not do ourselves. Um, we are, you know, can a slave actually go buy himself back out of the slave market? No, they, you know, yeah. 
Because when he gets enslaved, he loses all his money. They take it. And no, he, you know, there's no way he can get out unless someone chooses to buy him out. And that's what the Lord Jesus did for us. This is basically something that has to be a total act of grace because we can't die for our own sins. We can't pay for them. Jesus paid for them. That's justification. That's the essence of the gospel. But it's just a small part of what Jesus came to do. Notice it's according to the riches of his grace, not according to our works. Hebrews 9.22 and 10.18 have two other takes on this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. This is why Judaism is no longer able to be practiced as written in the Old Testament. The sacrifices are inefficacious. They don't work because there has to be shedding of blood. But when the temple gets destroyed, no more blood can be shed. And for those who think they kind of you know, break Christ's body on an altar every Sunday, just go to chapter 10, where there is remission of sins, there is no longer an offering for sin. Because Jesus once and for all did it, and our sins are paid for. Great. Okay, now our sins are paid for. Now what do we do? Well, according to you know, Luke 1, we're supposed to be serving him in righteousness and holiness. So uh, people don't always clue into that. So hopefully the rest of Jesus' manifesto at Nazareth will make that a little more clear. Not only did Jesus want to proclaim the remission of forgiveness of sins to the captives, but he wanted to re proclaim the recovery of sight to the blind. Note, first and foremost, it's recovery. People are not born totally blind. God does not want to bring us back, or you know, basically, he wants to bring us back to a place where we can see. It's a recovery of sight. That implies that there was sight there to begin with. In this spot. So Jesus said in 9.25, um, oh, not Jesus said, Jesus heals a guy in 9.25. So this is a physical healing of blindness. And the people are getting on the guy's case because he's basically a good advertisement for Jesus. And uh, he, the guy who's been healed is a little cagey. And he says, you know, I don't know whether the, Jesus was a the sinner or not. Actually, he didn't even know his name. But one thing I do know, whereas I was blind, now I see. And that is the testimony of every born-again Christian. Once we did not see, now we see. Once we didn't know Jesus died for our sins, now we know. For people to say, oh, I've always had a relationship with God. You know, God and I have been really tight since I was a wee tyke. You know, it's like they're still blind. Because they don't know that they went from one thing to another. And whenever you're sharing the gospel with someone, when they start going in that, this direction of, oh, you know, I don't really have a sin problem. Well, I guess you don't <laughs> see it because you're blind. Uh, they really do. A little later on, when Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees over this issue. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see. And I thought Jesus said, well, no, he didn't come to judge, and he didn't, but he's setting up the judgment. When he comes back his second time, when he proclaims the day of vengeance of our God, that's the peace of the Nazareth manifesto that he left off, then he actually executes judgment. But here he sets up the judgment. The dividing line is, what do you think about Jesus? So I've come into this world that those who do not see may see. That's us. We did not see, now we see. But this other part is kind of confusing. And that those who see may be made blind. What is going on there? It implies that people can see, and now they're made blind as a result of Jesus. Well, some of the Pharisees, very next verse, who were with him, heard these words, and they said to him, Are we blind also? Sneer, sneer. And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. If they were blind, you know, they're like a mentally incompetent person and, you know, a moron idiot in the old terminology. And, you know, you wouldn't be accountable for your sin. But because you say you know God's standards, because you say you're righteous, before you, because you say you know, um, you are accountable. And therefore your sin is imputed to you, and you um, are dead in it. So many people I've talked with will basically when come down to the fact that you need to accept Jesus for your sins. Well, I really haven't sinned. I'm better than the other guy. And you know that they're blind. Um, 
But Jesus actually makes these seeing people blind people, withdraws from them in the future, and they stay in their sin. But it's not just Pharisees who have this problem. Uh, believers have this as well. He who lacks certain things, according to 2 Peter 1.9, is short-sighted even to the point of blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Short-sighted means you can see the stuff real close. You can't see the far stuff that's farther out. I think we call it nearsighted. You can see near. Back then, this translation calls it um, short-sighted. So you can see what's close. And there are certain people who can just see what's directly in front of them, and they miss the stuff that is further out. There are people who lack certain things, and, and they forget that they have been cleansed from their sin, and they're supposed to live a new life. So who are the people who are basically functionally blind? Well, the previous verses of First Peter 1 and 2 Peter 1, 5 and 6 tell us. People who are lacking diligence, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love are short-sighted. He who lacks these things is short-sighted. And he forgot that he was cleansed from his sins. And if you, you know, look at the context, you're supposed to progress so you can have an abundant entrance into the future kingdom given to you. Revelation 3.17 continues some of this theme. Here Jesus is evaluating the churches from heaven. He looks down at the churches that exist in the early uh, Christian world, and he gives his take on them. He commends them for some stuff. He condemns them for other stuff. And in 3.17, he says to one of the churches, Because you say, I'm rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to fix it. There are Christians who have had their sins forgiven, who basically have got reached the point where they say, I have no needs. I can handle life on my own. I'm doing fine. I don't need anything. <coughs> These are the kind of people who run out of the house this morning in the morning without a quiet time. And they don't know that they, from God's perspective, are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. White garments, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed. It's actually shameful to show up in heaven naked. And anoint your eyes with eyes, save, salve, save, bah. salve, thank you, <laughs> that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Hebrews 12. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Change your thinking. Now, the very next verse. One of the mis most misquoted verses in history. This is in the four spiritual laws that's used to get people to accept Christ. It's people who basically, he loves, he's rebuking, who need to repent. They're people who have accepted him. They're people who are living independently of him, even though they've accepted him. And Jesus says, knock, knock. People answer, who's there? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus Christ. Don't you know anything? <laughs> anyway, he's standing there and knocking. He wants a relationship with people. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, we'll have a great time. I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And P.S. there's more. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne because I got my throne from overcoming as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. This is not a verse about getting your sins forgiven. This is a verse about fellowshipping with Jesus and cleaning up your act so you can do that. But most people don't see it. You know, why don't they see it? I don't know. They don't study their Bibles. They don't want to see the fact that they have needs. But if you um, are saying to yourself, well, I can handle my day today, um, you're probably really being blind. So what God wants people to do is see things accurately, see things clearly, and if a person is seeing things clearly and accurately, they're fellowshipping with Jesus, they're adding these things into their life in 2 Peter 1. They are overcoming, and they're walk, walk, working towards the victorious Christian life. Not the perfect Christian life, but the victorious Christian life. This is one of the things that Jesus came to have people do.
And just like he healed the brokenhearted on the physical plane and then went around showing that you need to do it on the spiritual plane, so here too he heals the blind on the physical plane and we need to have our eyes open to the truth. I always know when people uh, actually are starting to study their Bible because they'll come and say, wow, I, I, I can't believe all the stuff that's there that I've been missing. You know, it's like every passage, yeah, every chapter. It's amazing the stuff that's in there. You've all had this experience. And, you know, there are people who will argue, oh, it's not there. You don't see that. And you realize, okay, you're still blind. And blindness is largely self-inflicted. We'll see a little more in the next section. Next thing Jesus came to do is to set at liberty those who are oppressed. I love this passage, John 8.31. Jesus said to the Jews who believed him. Okay, who's, who's talking? Jesus. Who's he talking to? The Jews. What are the characteristics about these Jews? They believed in him. Oh, okay. So we got forgiven Jews who are actually believing in Jesus. And Jesus says, wait, there's more. <laughs> if you abide or remain in my word, you're my disciples indeed. One of the marks of a disciple is someone who abides in his word. John 15, the words abide in him and they get have a vibrant prayer life. You abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And hope for inductive Bible study. You shall know the truth. <laughs> if you continue to abide in the word, you will eventually get the truth. I know it might take hours sometimes. It might take weeks. It might take, you know, sleepless nights. But... The promise is, if you remain in the Word, you shall know the truth. The truth is knowable. It's not some mystery. It's, oh, you know, we don't know how God works. It's knowable. And not only that, it's effective in your life. The truth shall make you free. If you know the truth, it has changed your thinking. And a changed mindset is the key to the victorious Christian life. Don't know the truth, still bound to sin. And if a person is actually free, it's because the truth made them free. Because they learn to think about life and their circumstances and their situations and their values and everything from a different perspective. So, the Jews who believed him, who are sitting at Jesus' feet, hearing him teach, answered, <coughs> We are Abraham's descendants. So we have never been in bondage to anyone. Duh. <laughs> they are in bondage in so many levels. This is funny. You know, they've been enslaved to Babylon. They've been enslaved to Assyria. They've been enslaved to the Romans. They've been enslaved to their own passions and lusts. They've been enslaved to Satan. They're in the power of uh, the prince of darkness. They are about as enslaved as you get. And here they're saying, oh, well, we've never been enslaved. I mean, <laughs> how can they deny their history? How can they deny the present reality? And then, um, how can you say you shall be made free? And then Jesus, with one simple thrust of his rapier, says, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. It kind of looks to me that Jesus is actually advocating something called the victorious Christian life. He says, if you, if you commit, and I guess people will say regularly commit, and I'll go along with that, sin, you're a slave of sin. But... You're supposed to be made free from that. Sin shall not enslave you, shall not be your master. In fact, this is what Paul says in Romans 6. Great chapter. Um, there's also a great outline in toil about ink on a ring no more, about the sanctification process, which happens to be a mental process. It just amazes me. In my course, I'm covering a Kierkegaard and uh, responses to the Enlightenment, and basically people had an un- defendable Christian faith. So they say, oh, it's just a leap into the dark. And my faith is a reasonable step into the light. It's not a leap in the dark. There is nothing dark about my faith. <laughs> you know, dark is bad. So why leap in the dark? Light is good. Step into the light. Yet so many people, because they have adopted all these strange things that uh, they've added on to the scriptures, basically have reached the point where they say, God works in mysterious ways, it's wonders to perform, you just got accepted by faith. No, 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 no. It's a reasonable step into the light. And I would maintain that anybody who does not believe the scriptures is being unreasonable about it. So, what goes on in Romans 6.11 is the use of your brain. 
Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The main verb here is reckon. It's about as rational a word as you can get. It's an accounting word. <laughs> you know, it's just pure and simple facts. Believe the facts. It's used of, you look, oh, you, you want to, need to write a check. You open up your check register, or you go online and look at it, and you see how much money it says you have. And if you've got enough money to write the check, you have reckoned that that money is in your account. And you write the check. And then it bounces because you forgot you had another check that you didn't record. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but that's the reckoning process. You see the numbers and you say, it's there. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. I see the truth. It says I am dead to sin. Now, if you're dead to sin, it has no appeal to you. It has no power over you. You all know I am dead to green peppers. You know, I walk by the supermarket and they always wave at me. I, <laughs> Hi, Bill. Here we are. We taste good. We taste spicy and sharp. Oh, yum, yum, yum. Green peppers. I'm dead to you guys. Yeah. No appeal. No appeal whatsoever. I'll even pull them out of a dish. <laughs> it's like, even though they're there, they're so easy to eat them. No, thanks. I'm dead to you guys. Because you guys might be sick. That should be our approach to sin. Reckon yourself dead to sin. No appeal. Like, there's no battle, there's no struggle. It's like, <laughs> there's no, nothing. I, I have no response to temptation uh, when I've gone through this process correctly. So, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed. Indeed. Oh, there's a, that's even another added emphasis word, but alive to God in Christ Jesus Lord. And just look at the context of Romans 6. And uh, if you haven't memorized most of this, uh, it's probably pretty good to do that. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Wow, is that something Jesus does for me? Uh, just let go and let God? Uh, not quite. I think this is addressed to me as a believer. Do not let sin reign. You mean I have a choice? I'm not just this hopeless worm that's redeemed by God's gracious goodness? No, I am someone who actually has a choice. I can choose to let sin reign or not. My choice. After the will. So there's a mental process and after the will. Do not obey it. Do you not know that to whomever you yield, this person says present, yourselves slaves to obey, that you you are that one slaves whom you obey? Your choice. Don't you know this? That if you yield yourself to sin, you obey sin, you let sin become your master again. And you can yield yourself to sin or to God. So you yield yourself to sin, that results in death, loss of dominion, lack of reward, lack of power, lack of victory. Or you can yield yourself to God and that results in obedience, which leads to righteousness. This righteousness that God wants us to walk in. Last week I did the metaphor of a tree of righteousness that has fruit of righteousness. That's what God's all about. That's how he gets glorified. So the choice is mine. There are lots of stories of the Civil War of slaves who had been set free by the Emancipation Proclamation who still go about their normal jobs. It's like, <laughs> you're free. Get out of here. And, but they're just so used to doing the same thing, same thing, same thing, that they still live in bondage even though they had been set free. And that is the case with many, many believers. Um, I always think of the poor little elephants when I read this passage. Um, you notice the circus elephants, you know, these big, massive beasts. And if you look, they've got a little rope around their leg, a rope. And it's tied to a little stake in the ground. Okay, they pound it in a little bit. But elephants are strong, and they could break that rope like that. But when they were little elephants, they were tied with a stronger rope really tightly to something that they could not move. And they kind of grew accustomed to the fact that they were in bondage and they could not break through. And they tried and tried and pulled and pulled and they just couldn't do it. And then as they grew up, they had the strength to actually break through. And every now and then you hear an elephant getting loose and kind of went crazy. You stupid elephant, didn't you know you're not supposed to break that thing? <laughs> you go on a rampage and kill a few people, trample things. Um, but by and large, their lack of victory breaking through when they were little leaves them still in bondage when they're big. And that is true of Christians. Pre-Christ, pre-living 
with the truth abiding in us and the Spirit empowering us, we weren't that successful in trying to live righteously. And we kind of have given up on it. We think, oh, I could never do that. Or, you know, we kind of pretend we're doing it when we're not. But God has basically given us the power to break free from it. The chains are off. And people actually go back and pick up their chains and put them back on. And <laughs> Why are you wearing your chains still? Well, yeah, I'm kind of used to them. I'm comfortable with them. Uh, they look actually nice on me. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like they, they go back and they've been freed, but they're still living in bondage. That's why Romans 6 says, Reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Jesus' purpose in coming is to set at liberty those who are oppressed. By the way, sin is oppressive. Sin are habits, sins are ways of thinking. It's like sin affects and permeates so much of our world because it's been set up by Satan. Well, one of the reasons why Jesus came is to set us free from sin. And he's not going to do it against your will. Chains are off. You need to kind of take them off and get out. Uh, one of the times when Jesus uh, raised last someone from the dead, it was Lazarus, I think it's really interesting that he raised him, and he could have raised him any way he wanted. Like today we celebrate Easter when Jesus was raised and he went right through the grave clothes. The grave clothes are still there. You know, raised and the, the stuff is still right there. But when Lazarus was raised, he was raised and the grave clothes were still on him. And then basically the, Jesus tells the people and they take the grave clothes off him. And that's kind of the imagery. We've been raised, but we need other people to help us go through this process of getting free from the old grave, grave clothes. Um, by the way, grave clothes uh, tend to stink when you continue to wear them. All right, so <laughs> he wants to set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is why Jesus came. This is great news, and this is something that we can uh, enter into. Simple obedience. Jesus said to those who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and truth shall make you free. And last but not least, Jesus said he came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, most commentators take this back to what is known in the Old Testament as the year of Jubilee. The great song on it. And uh, if Jubilee was an interesting thing. As far as I know, it was never practiced by the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was really not good at following God's instructions uh, on this. Every seven days, you're supposed to rest. No work. Remember that? The Sabbath? That was the mark of the Old Testament covenant. It's the only command that's not repeated in the New Testament. And in the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, it has a different verb form. And for every year they failed to, to give the land its rest, which I'm getting to, they were in captivity. So this was like the really important thing, but they blew it. They blew it on the weekly basis. You know, they basically, the rabbis would give them sanction to kind of set a piece of string from their house. So they could basically say, my house extends two miles down the road because I have to deliver a sheep to one of my neighbors that he bought, and they're doing business like they're not supposed to on the Sabbath. But, you know, they're not leaving their house because they've had a little piece of string. The rabbi said, as far as that string is from your house, that's your house. So they kind of got around it, and they didn't, you know, honor the commands of the Sabbath, which was their, for their benefit. Then every seven years, they were not supposed to plant their fields, not even supposed to reap them, and they had to trust that God would, have, would provide uh, enough to tide them over in the sixth year. Well, what God provided the extra, they kind of either spent it or did something that it, you know, it beyond their means. I'm not sure exactly how that worked. But that was the thing that really annoyed God. So he sends them into captivity for every one of those, se every seventh year, they didn't keep the Sabbath year. Then every group of seven, seven years, which is 49 years, there was the year of Jubilee. And there's actually still one more Sabbath rest that remains for the book of Hebrews for us, and that's the future kingdom. But this one here is the year of Jubilee, and it's an amazing kind of thing. Let's take a look at its passage in Luke 25, 10. And you shall consecrate the 50th year. So this is after the 49, 40, 
the 49 years, the 77 years, shall consecrate, set apart as holy, the 50th year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession. Each of you shall return to his family. And blah, blah, blah. It has a lot of things. They're supposed to get back their land. If they had been sold into slavery, they were free. If you had bought someone because they couldn't pay their debts, came, comes the year of Jubilee, every 50 years, you had to set them free. Uh, if you had lost your land from, because of you know bad circumstances, poor planning, stupidity, bad poker hand, whatever, it got back to you. It got returned to you. Um, I sometimes have fun with my more rabid libertarian friends about, hey, you know, this looks like a redistribution of wealth, if you ask me. And one of the reasons I think God did this is because people are unequal. Like, <laughs> the fact that we're created equal, yeah, we're created equal in the sight of God, we're equal under the law. But um, there are people that are more advantaged than others. And one of the things that happens throughout history is wealth always flows from the less advantaged to the more advantage. That's the nature of the thing. The person who has more advantages, more connections, better insight, better education, they're going to basically get the stuff of the person who's less advantaged. The person who has was raised with more discipline is going to work better and succeed. And what eventually happens is the people who become the have-nots get annoyed and they revolt and you have class warfare and your civilization almost collapses. So, one of the challenges that remains for every civilization is how do you redistribute the wealth so that there isn't class warfare. In our day and age, we actually have a wealth redistribution process in the United States, even though we are not yet technically a socialist country. It's called taxes. And the taxes go to public education. And we basically try to redistribute the wealth by making the less advantaged a little bit more advantaged. People don't take advantage of that, they become less and less advantaged as time goes on. But back in the Old Testament time, this distribution thing kind of put everybody back on an even footing. You went back to your original inheritance, your original thing, a piece of land, and you could kind of start all over again. And there are actually things in the scriptures that say, you know, if you know that um, the year of Jubilee is coming up, you the amount you pay for the land is factored in, so you recognize that you're going to have to get the land back in five years or ten years, whatever the year of Jubilee is. But the major point that I want to bring up in terms of a year of Jubilee now, let me do two things with this. First of all, th this happened in Jesus' time. Well, when Jesus came during his first appearance here on earth, he proclaimed an acceptable year of the Lord. He proclaimed a fresh start for people. You could do it all over again. Isaiah 49.8, which is a little bit earlier from the Man uh, Nazareth Manifesto, but this gets quoted in the New Testament, says, Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, in the day of salvation I have helped you, I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit desolate heritage. So basically he's referring to this, this, the servant nation of Israel at this time. He hears them, and he wants them to basically be able to lead others back to him. This gets quoted in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, where God says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The way the New Testament authors use this concept is that God is now visiting his people and you can kind of get a fresh start. And that's something that I think all of us need. Um, when I was in school, I used to love the beginning of every semester. Now as a prof, I hate it because I have to have all my stuff done ahead of time before the semester starts. And that's because you know, I used to have this huge push to try to get everything done by the end of the semester. And being a P and not being that disciplined at times, I had stuff that you know, I had to sometimes get extensions for and stuff like that. But when a new semester started, this semester is going to be different. <laughs> <laughs> year after year, this semester is going to be different. Yeah, yeah. It never happened. <laughs> But the idea was that you did get a new start. I mean, it, you didn't start behind the eight ball. You didn't start missing assignments. And then I began to realize, oh, the really start people already had gotten the textbooks, had read most of the textbooks, had form study groups, they even had their outlines together. 
I think, well, you guys just ruined it for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> But we do get a fresh start in Christ. He forgives us our sins. He gives us all that we need to do his will and you know, clean up our act and live righteously and all this great stuff. And we get a fresh start. And the nice thing is we get a fresh start every day. Uh, one of the recovery programs has a point that says, this is the first day of the rest of your life. You know what? It really is. If you want to do anything differently, this is the first day of a whole new life of doing something differently. If you want to pick one area of your life and say, I am dead to sin, I don't have to be under the control of it anymore, I am set free from that, first day of the rest of your life, a fresh start. God is so gracious that he lets people start all over. It's like you know the video game reset. <laughs> you know you can just kind of reset it and start it all over again. You get all the lives back again, and you you know go and play and get killed and you know it up and everything. And oops, and then, yeah, and then you go back and restart it. That's kind of what it is with Christianity. That God will always give you the ability to restart. Um, a lot of you, some of you heard the edification or praise last time of Ahab. You know, Ahab was horrible, yet God lets him repent. And if you look at how horrible he was, why is he in there? Why do we have all those deeds? Because there's hardly anybody on this planet has been as bad as Ahab was. And God gives him a fresh start and repents. It's a beautiful thing about God. Paul picks this up in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in union with Christ, if anyone is in a relationship with Jesus Christ, guess what? He's a new creation. All things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So if you have accepted Christ's forgiveness, um, you have him pay your death penalty. And that's really the essence of faith. You believe that Jesus' death is accepted by the Father. That, that, that's the initial justifying, saving faith. Jesus' death is acceptable for my sins. Once you believe that, you're in. You believe, you then see what the Spirit, Spirit comes into your life. New creation. What you might have done, that's past. Now, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? This is the first day of it. And even if you've been walking for God for a while, today still it starts a new uh, phase in your life. Verse 18 goes on to tell us what we should be doing with this new life. Now all things are of God. He's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. God's initiative, he has reconciled us to himself by means of Christ's death. And has given us... Paul speaking on behalf of the apostles and believers down through the ages, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Remember, God so loved the world that he gave his Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And God was not imputing their trespasses to them. So basically, he wipes the slate clean. And then he has committed to us this word of reconciliation. So what should we do now that we have been forgiven, we have this word of reconciliation, we are now ambassadors for Christ. You might work for a particular company and be a representative of that company, but ultimately you are an ambassador for Christ. Your citizenship, believe it or not, some people would say this thankfully, <laughs> is not the United States of America. It's actually your citizenship is in heaven. You, your passport really should say Kingdom of God. That's you know where you're headed, but that would never get you through an airport security check. <laughs> but we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We represent his will and his attentions in our world. And it's as though God was pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the message that we are given that we are to share with others. And then the essence of the gospel gets repeated. For God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, he's sinless, to be sin for us, that's the substitutionary atonement. He died in our place so that we don't have to. It's my favorite way of explaining the gospel. Why? That we might be forgiven? Yes, but that's not what the text says. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus died for us, was resurrected, not just so we can get to heaven, but so we can become righteous. 
and that righteousness happens as we are in union with him. There's a difference between believing Jesus and being in Jesus. In Christ is almost considered by some a technical term to be referring to people who are justified. But if you look at the context, it's for people who are dining with Jesus, who have fellowship with him, who are in union with him, who have embraced his objectives for their lives, and as a result, um, wind up becoming ambassadors for him. So one of the points I made at the beginning of Roman numeral 2 is God uses his servants so people can experience all of his blessings. And you are saved to be his servant. You are now a servant of God. And as Jesus said at the end of John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So we are now to be used to do the same thing that Jesus did as his ambassadors. We need to proclaim, hey, there's a kingdom coming. You know, and don't worry about exactly how things work out on this earth. God will eventually make it right in the kingdom. Broken hearts can be healed. Lives that are devastated in little pieces can be put back together. as part of our message. Yes, there's freedom, forgiveness to those who are taken captive by sin, which happens to be everyone. And then there's recovery of sight to the blind, even though they just don't get it. It's offered. And then there's liberty for those who are oppressed or those who are going to reckon themselves dead to sin and alive to God. And then there's this whole fresh new start. In Christ, you're a new creature. You've got this whole new future to look forward to. So that's when Jesus said on the cross, it's finished. He finished. He did all this stuff. He trained a group of people to go do it. And we trace our spiritual lineage back through a line of people throughout the centuries who have taken God at his word and proclaimed this message and we've accepted it. Okay, questions on what I said, or on some of the ones down below. Yeah, Randy. Um, as a believer, how many fresh starts? How many fresh starts for believers? Oh yeah, you're thinking about Hebrews 6. It's impossible to renew you again to repentance. Yeah, there are some consequences renewing again to that initial repentance. Um, but hey, you know, let's make the best of the situation from where we've got it now. Yeah, the righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. Did he lose anything for falling those seven times? Maybe it depends on how well he gets back up. But when you look at God dealing with the nation of Israel, they fall multiple times, but if they're willing to repent, he brings them back up. However, a little scary thing here, the first temple that Solomon built was really big. The temple that they rebuild after they come back from uh, Babylon under Ezra, Nehemiah, and uh, one other guy in there, is smaller. But when it, the, the foundation of the temple gets laid, there's a big cry. And the, all the young people are crying, yay, we got the temple you know, together. And all the old ones are saying, ah, but it's so small. <laughs> and then God says, well, don't worry, the glory of this temple will be greater than the glory of Solomon's temple because this temple that Jesus actually walked into. So one of the principles you can get out of this is, yeah, if you, you know, don't progress, you don't do what you're supposed to, God's infinitely just, you might lose. However, if you are walking correctly and righteously, don't worry about the past. Satan is the one who's always going to accuse you about the past. God never brings up the past. Maybe at the judgment seat we see it, but, you know, it's like, what do I do from this day forward is what matters. I can't do anything about what happened before. I might work a little harder. Like Paul actually worked a little harder because of what his past was. Maybe you can balance it out. I don't know. Garrett, did you have a... Oh, yeah, sorry. I was um, you mentioned something about um, the first of Christian life was cultural. Um, and you have a lot of people that have a huge other service, but it's about And James said, James said, no, it's a, it's the same word, teleos, it has different kinds of meanings. So it's also used for mature, but be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, that that sets a pretty good standard. Um, there are some groups that the Wesleyan groups claim that 
you're perfect in Christ, and it's all he's the one who gets the perfection, and you just enter into it by faith with a very imperfect life. There are other people who claim or pretend that they're perfect, but the reality is we all sin. First John 1 says, you know, if anyone says they don't sin, they're deceiving themselves, they're lying. So how do you balance off those two? And one is, you know, the only perfect person was Jesus. No one is going to walk like Jesus did. And anyone who's, I think, claiming that has this little pride problem, which kind of makes them imperfect. <laughs> oh, do you see how perfect I am? I just lost it. So... I think we should become like Christ. We're being transformed into every changing degrees of glory. So it's a process. It's not an absolute state. So it's an ongoing process. The goal is to be perfect like your Heavenly Father is perfect. Um, yeah, I think I'd be accurate. As a father, I am pleased with my children who um, are striving to do what is right, even though their performance might not be perfect. You know, like when they were sitting in a high chair, they would keep the mashed potatoes and peas out of their hair and nose. I, I was I was pleased with them. You know, now if that same standard, we've upped it a little bit. So, you know, you guys don't try that at Easter dinner. <laughs> You know, we actually stopped serving peas to solve that problem. <laughs> so, yeah, it is funny. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for using all the power that's available. So, um, don't let me um, dissuade you from going in that direction. Yeah, the, the power is there. God, we can always have all we need to do God's will. That is, He always provides. Will we avail ourselves of it? Have we trained ourselves to use it? A lot of times the power is there, but yeah, I just don't know how to use it. You know, it's like you're getting attacked and there's a, you know, AK-47, but you don't know, you know, how to use it. Well, you stick the end and shoot. Uh, but, you know, you just, you know, so we, we fail because we haven't trained ourselves, disciplined ourselves. And then there's this other piece about righteousness where you have to, to go back to the Hebrews passage from last week, you know, make straight paths for your feet. You've got stuff to do, and if you haven't done that preparation ahead of time of strengthening yourself, then you're not going to succeed in that race. But then there's always the next race. There's always the next pass. Yes, Steve? So, um, I, I, uh, It's more that an internal, well, there are, is some external, but the stuff that this is talking about is the internal sin where bad habits have rule over you. Sometimes uh, people used to talk about besetting sins. You know, uh, it's from Hebrews 12, the sin that so easily entangles us, where we're told to lay it aside. And normally those are bad ways of responding to situations, bad ways of responding to people. You know, oh, I shouldn't have said that. All right, well, you know, that, that's kind of in one way oppression. Our self-image is a major source of oppression for people, the way they think of themselves. Um, they think of themselves as worms are only going to sin, they'll continue to do that. They think of themselves as someone, I need others to build me up. You know, it's like the, that can, people can be oppressed by that. I know some people who are, you know, all growing up now, but they're still little kids looking for worth and value. And it controls them. You, know, you all know, you walk into a room and you know, there will be people that come up to you and they are just looking to be affirmed because they haven't been pleasing God. All right, in one sense, that they're oppressed by that. But, uh, there are others who are entangled by various addictions. You know, that, that, that's an, definitely an oppression. Um, 
So there's you know there's lots of stuff that we're self it's the self inflicted oppression. Yeah, Bill, yeah. you have used uh, your example of being tested a number of times. But what bothers me about that example is that you know the Indian Shepherds are going to get sick. Therefore, it's reasonably easy to not eat the Green Shepherds because you know you're going to get sick. Sin is more insidious than that. Sin has what appears to be pleasure or attractiveness or whatever, and often no immediate consequence that we are aware of. Every time we did something wrong, we immediately got sick and said, well, we didn't do those things. We have been separate example. But I find that in my life, at least over the years, sin is more insidious than that, and therefore more difficult to control than just saying, well, I'm dead to sin, and that's fine, but we're tempted every day with things that don't immediately. Right. The green peppers are a little more obvious. However, last week, we uh, go to our a deli at our local supermarket, and they pack up a bunch of cheese odds and ends. And you know, so we like to try all these different things. We, we love getting them. And I saw this one, and it you know, looked like it might have had some little herbs in it. So I bit into it. I'm thinking, I think this might have peppers in it. And I should have just spit it out. But instead I thought, hmm, that could taste pretty good. <laughs> and I didn't throw up, but I had trouble sleeping that night. You know, it was, you know, even though it was a pepper, even though I know they're bad, it's just that, there was just another desire. I just wasn't focused. I wasn't paying attention. Think it sneak up on us like that. On a lot of things, it's like if you've sinned in the same area more than once, it's like okay, <laughs> there's a pattern that develops, and we sin dozens of times in some things before God gets our attention on it. I mean, in fact, some in some areas in, of our lives, people sin for decades, not realizing the damage it's doing to them in their testimony. So yeah, it's insidious. But I think if God wants us to be able to not let sin reign over us and reckon ourselves that the sin, we have to be able to understand what it is. And as you read the scriptures, it says, don't do this, don't point it out. And, you know, the Proverbs talks about a lot of stuff that's sin. We're still tempted by it. You know, Satan is no dummy. <laughs> you know, if, if everything was as obvious as a pile of green peppers, then, you know, he'd be out of a job. But uh, it, he cloaks it. You know, the, 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 the point of my question if, if, wouldn't it be nice if we were in heaven and immediately pay the consequences then it would be a lot easier not to do that in the next time. It would be no when yeah. it seems like you're quote getting away with something or it is fun or whatever the case might be. Thank you. That <laughs> 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 Go ahead and do it without even realizing. Right. So that's why there's like the body members to help you see. There's you know exposing yourself to Bible teaching that kind of points out stuff. Reading your Bible. I mean, it's all ways that God can bring to our awareness to make it really obvious. In fact, one of the goals of Proverbs in the end of chapter one is to make sin so obvious that it's like a group of people saying to you, "Hey, well, let's go and you know steal this guy's money." You know, would any of you do that? <laughs> you wouldn't, but that would, you know, that's because you have a discernment that that stuff is bad. But if someone doesn't pay any attention to God's word, they don't know this stuff is bad. Just one more question about what you mentioned about being, uh, um, just doing the morning, but um, the end of the progressive. Here God, I give this commandment to the the Lord will bring every word in the judgment and give it every percent for the creation. Good news. I'm just making a case that yes, you do get to do that every day, but there will be no sin with impunity. Yeah, it's just not like you, you want to sin with impunity. You know, but I think more people who have, are tender towards God don't you know, wrestle with high-handed sins, but get more tempted to not strive because Satan says, oh, you'll never succeed. You know, and it always brings up past failures. When the when God brought, the Old Testament is so great for stuff like this, when God brought the nation of Israel back and he wants to restore them, so Rubbabel, that was the guy I was thinking of earlier, rebuilt the rubble of the temple. But Satan is there accusing him. He's always oh, not clean, he's not this and not that. And God says, 
cool, Kenneth Satan, uh, I'm, I've chosen him to do this and uh, I'll make him adequate for the task. So, you know, we, we do get a new start and uh, a lot of people do wallow in their past, but hey, there's a new life ahead of you. We have the rest of our days here on earth to live. And if you want to live them differently, you can start today. And if, you know, you, you both... Motivation to make sure that from now on I, I minimize those things that will be... Uh, yeah. I mean, it would be wonderful if we got to heaven and, and, you know, God brought that up and we were able to say, yeah, that used to be me. But by your grace, that, that's not me anymore. Food's here, so let's pray. Thank you, Father, that in Jesus there is power. That the power that brought him back from the dead is the power that dwells with us. You take our mortal bodies and turn them into glory. Thank you that your grace is sufficient for every problem that we face. You can open up eyes of blind, they can heal us, they're broken hearted, give us an inheritance in the future. Um, thank you that your salvation of us is so total and so complete. I pray that we would enter into it in every aspect and would bring you the glory that you intend. We recognize you do these great things for us as a reflection of your glory. May we fulfill the purpose for which you've created us. We pray you bless our fellowship. Thanks for food. In Christ's name, amen.